But then you might be saying, I think I might have the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease. Could that be? Doctors look for five things. They first look for, can you learn and remember? Then can you reason things out and solve problems? They also look for what's called visual spatial ability. Can you recognize shapes? If I ask you to draw a clock, can you get the numbers in order and that kind of thing? Then they also look at language and then they look at personality. If all five of those things are goofing up, then doctors say, I think this could be Alzheimer's disease. All right, you go to the doctor. You say, I don't want that. My parents had Alzheimer's disease. My father had, I, I don't want this. And the doctor sits you down and they say, well, it's genetic. You should pick different parents. That's what you can do. Well, here, here are the numbers. If one parent gives you this gene called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele, if you get that from one parent, you have three times the risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to not having it. And if you got it from both parents, you've got between 10 and 15 times the risk. And that's the end of the story for most people. Nothing you can do, just wait and see what happens. Wait a minute. Turns out there's a lot you can do. Anybody know what this is? That is Chicago, exactly. And the reason I'm showing you Chicago is back in 1993, an important study began called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. And they brought in a group of, a large group, thousands of healthy people, and they carefully tracked what they were eating. And then, as one year and another year and another year and another year went by, they looked at links between what they had been eating and who stayed mentally clear and who did not. And the first thing that they tracked was something that I knew about when I was a kid. When I was growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, I'd run down to the kitchen, my mom would be cooking bacon. And her five kids would gather around and she would take a fork and carefully pull the bacon strips out of the pan and put them on a paper towel to drain. And when all the bacon was out of the pan, she had a pan filled with hot grease that she was not going to throw away, right? So she would take that hot bacon grease and carefully pour it into a jar to save it. Now, the bacon, jar did, the bacon grease jar did not go in the refrigerator. She just put it on the shelf because she knew that as bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It solidifies, right? It turns into this waxy solid. And the next day, she would spoon it back into the frying pan and fry eggs in it. It's amazing that any of her kids lived to adulthood, but that's what we did. Um, the fact that bacon grease is solid at room temperature is a sign that it's very high in what is called saturated fat. You've heard of saturated fat, right? This is the kind that raises your cholesterol. Well, it's in bacon. It's also in butter and other dairy products, and it's in meat. And these were things that we ate every day in, in growing up in Fargo, and maybe you grew up with the same kind of pattern. And that was the first thing that the researchers in Chicago started keying in on. Some people ate relatively little saturated fat, 13 grams a day. Others got about twice that amount, 25 grams a day. And they looked at who got Alzheimer's disease and who didn't. And here are the numbers. The people who got the 25 grams a day had more than three times the Alzheimer's risk compared to the others. Okay, so that's our first clue. And it's really, relatively easy to get up to that 25 grams a day. If I take a couple of eggs, that's three grams of saturated fat. Let, let me add a strip of bacon, that's another gram. Let me take a chicken thigh, even without the skin, it's about five grams of saturated Did you know that chicken has a substantial amount of fat? About five grams of chicken thigh with no skin. Glass of milk, another five grams. Oh yeah, pizza. Okay, so one pizza, a pizza for one, is about 12, and you add that up, I'm in the high-risk group. Do, do you know anybody who eats that way? <laughs> Everybody eats that way. This is the way Americans eat. Okay, but it's not just Alzheimer's disease. Researchers in Finland said, what about this mild cognitive impairment? You remember me t talking about this condition where you're still yourself, but your memory is starting to, to be bad. They brought in a group of people, and they, they were 50 years old when they brought them in. They tracked them up into their 70s, and they looked at who got, out, who got mild cognitive dementia, who didn't. And they tracked their saturated fat. Some were low, some were high in, in saturated fat. And here are the numbers. The people who got this bad fat 
had a lot more of the mild cognitive impairment also. So there's something about bacon grease and dairy fat and so forth that is harming the brain. Now, what about people who have that gene? Remember the APOE epsilon 4 allele, the one that condemns you? Well, they looked at those folks. Some people who had that gene avoided bad fats. Some people who had the gene didn't avoid them and they had a high fat intake. Here are the numbers. Dramatic difference. So, in other words, the people who had the gene but they were avoiding the bad fats tended to keep their memory. The people who had the gene and ate the bacon grease and so forth, their memories went. Is this making sense? Okay. So, oh, but, oh yeah, what about that? What about that? Well, you go into a typical donut shop and the donuts are frying in, tra you know about trans fats, right? Partially hydrogenated oil. This is the shortening they, they put in there. It's solid when they put it in. It heats up and it liquefies and it has that mouth feel that people like. It's in a lot of snack foods. And in Chicago, some people ate relatively little. Some people ate a lot of it. And here are the numbers. Dramatic difference. Okay, so about five times the risk. If you, eat, if you indulge in a lot of these trans fats versus not indulging in it. Now, when doctors saw those numbers, when the research community saw those numbers, they were horrified because they thought, how many Americans are eating these bad fats? Not just, well, I mean, every day, a few times a day. These are routine. We feed them to kids. When I saw those numbers, I was thrilled because it means we can choose what we're going to eat starting right this minute. And we can start pushing the odds in our own favor. All right, so there are three steps for using power foods for the brain. The first is to skip the bad fats. The second is to knock out free radicals. In a minute, I'm going to tell you what they are. And the third thing is to exercise your brain. We're going to cover all of them. Okay, first, let's start with skipping the bad fats. All right, so I'm in Chicago and I'm eating all these bad things. Can I make some changes? Well, I better because my risk of Alzheimer's is high. So, what can I do? Let me get rid of that glass of milk. How about that? We'll get rid of that and we'll have, how many have, have tasted almond milk? It's fine, right? Very tasty, has no saturated fat. So, if the numbers in Chicago apply to me, I just cut my risk of Alzheimer's disease because I got away from the saturated fat. Can I do better than that? Can I get rid of more foods? Yeah. Easily, sure, let's get rid of that bacon. How about having veggie bacon instead? Let's get rid of the eggs. How about a big bowl of oatmeal with blueberries and strawberries? Let's get rid of that chicken thigh. I'll have a big submarine sandwich filled with all the veggies. And how am I gonna do? Well, if the research numbers apply to me, my Alzheimer's risk just fell even more. Is there something else that I can change? Oh, yeah. What about that pizza? Could I, could I get a vegan pizza? You know, pizza is a delivery vehicle for cheese. And so, you know it's true. So we're going to get rid of that. We're going to bring in the vegan pizza. And now, how am I doing? Well, I can't tell you because nobody in Chicago eats that well. But, <laughs> however, there are some people who eat that well. In Loma Linda, California, diets vary dramatically. And people at Loma Linda University tracked a group of what they called heavy meat eaters. And over a six-year period, they looked at who was gradually losing their brain function. And they compared them with a group of vegetarians. The vegetarians did a whole lot better, okay? All right, so, by, by the way, you do need some fat, right? This is, not, this is not a zero-fat diet, and the brain actually does need some good fats. So which fat is best for the brain? Is it A, corn oil, B, peanut oil, C, sunflower oil, or D, olive oil? 